Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you for tuning into this uh, video lecture. Uh, today I'd like to talk about neoclassicism around the École des Beaux-Arts, which was an extension and transformation of the Royal Academy of Architecture in France, so an institution that we discussed a couple of uh, video lectures ago. The École, in fact, is very important for us today, if for no other reason than for the fact that its influence persists in architectural theory and education down to our day, ranging from the design studio model, which you are all very familiar with, to the juried architectural competition, known as the uh, charrette, to the architectural thesis as a capstone to a professional architectural degree. But equally as important, many of the ideas to come out of the école were highly influential to the development of modernism. We're talking the emphasis on the plan, for example, or a formalist attitude towards architectural composition, or an emerging functionalism. And yet, in an interesting sort of twist, modernism would develop with a sort of hatred of these same ideas, right? Or at least the uh, non-functionalist ideas, mainly because they contradicted, or at least seemed to contradict, modernism's desire for, and I'll quote, a clean break from the past. So remember that term, a clean break from the past. This is essentially what modernism predicated itself on. So in any case, uh, what I want to discuss today through this video are uh, some of the foundational attitudes, ideas, and projects to come out of this institution during the 19th century. And this will begin to sort of frame the next uh, module of this course, which is going to deal with the emergence of uh, modernism. Actually, that's going to be the third module, uh, but we'll be uh, transitioning to a conversation on modernization and how that turns into modernism. So key to that is um, a discussion of some of these foundational ideas coming out of the École. Now, if you recall the last lecture on early neoclassicism, we talked about the effect of the encyclopedia on architectural theory, and the problem of categorizing architecture, where should it fall under? The big question was, was it uh, an art? Was it a science? Uh, was it part of uh, the physical world, the metaphysical world? What was its relationship to philosophy? How does one begin to categorize architecture as a form of knowledge? These questions would resurface late in the 18th century, around the role of architecture in an academy itself. Well, recall that the Royal Academy of Architecture in France was founded in 1671 under the reign of Louis XIV. And of course, in between 1671 and around 1899-1900, the political landscape had changed radically. There were revolutions, uh, the way that knowledge was distributed was vastly different, advances in science and advances in technology, uh, advances in mathematics, the relativity of culture. These things began to push on education in general and essentially every kind of cultural institution imaginable. So that by the late 1800s, the Royal Academy of Architecture would essentially be split into two different schools, right, two different écoles. On one hand, you would have the École des Beaux-Arts, roughly translated, let's say, School of Fine Arts. And on the other side, you would have the École Polytechnique sort of uh, what we call today a polytechnic, right, or uh, a, an institution of technology and science. The École des Beaux-Arts would eventually hold or uh, um, give way to an academy of architecture and an academy of painting and sculpture. And in this model, of course, it's clear to see that architecture is being uh, categorized as a fine art, or a decorative art, perhaps, um, in the family of artistic practices. The Ecole Polytechnique 
would, of course, offer architectural studies uh, masked through the lens of engineering. So if you wanted to study engineering in 1795, you would go to the École Polytechnique. If you wanted to study, let's say, decoration, painting, architecture, you would go to the École des Beaux-Arts. So it's an interesting sort of split, right? Um, and it's a model that we roughly follow today, not exclusively and not everywhere. But there still are some architecture schools that refuse to acknowledge or at least emphasize in their curriculum the uh, heavy material scientific basis of architecture. It's not to say it ignores them, but some schools focus more on issues of design uh, as somehow separate from issues of technology and construction. And so you have two ways then essentially to categorize architecture and two kinds of uh, architectural education that you might get. Architecture in relationship to art and design, architecture in relation to science and engineering. Now keep in mind, this is a simplified story, right? It's a sort of reduction. A lot of the professors that taught at the École des Beaux-Arts would eventually go on to teach at the École Polytechnique and vice versa. So that this imaginary split between architecture as an art and architecture as a science never really holds weight. And in fact, that's part of the problem, right? I mean, we'll, we'll remind everyone that the problem brought up with the encyclopedia has not been resolved. The moment you want to say that architecture is a pure art, you have to confront its scientific implications and vice versa. So that really to split architecture from these two realms uh, in an absolute way uh, is, is sort of spinning your wheels, right? So that in mind, I want to talk about some of the proto-functionalist ideas uh, to come out of the École des Beaux-Arts and to come out of the École Polytechnique. And again, it's interesting because some of these uh, functionalist ideas are the very ideas that would become foundations for what would eventually become modernism and the modern movement. The first person I want to mention is Louis Ambroix Dubu. And in particular, his uh, Architecture Civile, written in 1803, which was a fairly uh, modest treatise. And what makes it interesting, uh, well, two things. One, it's dedicated uh, to the study of um, uh, civil architecture, uh, and it is also a direct critique of his professor, Claude Nicolas Ledoux, a revolutionary architect who, of course, uh, was interested in the character of buildings. In other words, how uh, the character of buildings expressed something about uh, the architecture. And what Dubu essentially says is that exterior decoration, contra les deux, does not depend on decor or character, but rather on the disposition and arrangement of the plan. Now think about this for a minute. This is a very important idea. We've heard it in several different ways before, but it's a very important idea. Right? One, it's worth to keep in mind that it would be in the 19... 20s, that Le Corbusier would be championing the idea that the plan is the generator of architecture. So the idea that the architect's responsibility, the architect's agency, the architect's role is in the position and arrangement of the plan really lends to architecture less of an emphasis on style, more of an emphasis on function. I'll tell you what I mean. It is entirely possible to design a facade without understanding what the relationship between that facade and the plan is. Just think of Alberti, who essentially added facades to existing buildings and worked from the facade first and then perhaps made uh, arrangements or, or modifications to the plan. Not so when the facade becomes elevation. So one of the things to come out 
of uh, these ideas around the Ecole des Beaux-Arts and around these proto-functionalist ideas is the separation between the plan and the facade, right? The facade loses a certain amount of importance, and a relationship between a plan and an elevation, an elevation being a direct product of the plan. Now, what this also means here is, quite frankly, that uh, because style doesn't matter, the elevation can almost be anything, right? So you can have a plan, and you can assign to that plan, let's say, a Gothic elevation, or a Greek one, or a Roman one. Really, it doesn't matter, right? This becomes the realm of the client. This becomes the realm of the public. But the architect's really concerned here with function. So the very thing that lends architecture a sort of uh, functionalism, although that's not quite the appropriate word to use yet, but let's just use it for a minute, the very thing that lends architecture a sort of functionalism is also the very thing that allows architecture to be eclectic. right? And these are two things that modernism and the modern movement would eventually grapple with, right? a sort of hatred for eclecticism and a desire for functionalism. Uh, without necessarily resolving the fact that both of these ideas are implicated in one another. Another important figure is Jean-Baptiste Rondelet. And one of the things Rondelet did that was significant was to establish a comprehensive theory of materials through the rigorous study of works of civil engineering. So the use of iron, in bridges uh, and other sort of public structures. And these are some of the drawings to come out of his treatise. So you see here it's not, it's a very different character from say a Desgodets or a Leroy, right? One going to Rome and sort of measuring the proportions of buildings, the other doing the same in Greece. Now, this is a study of architecture in its construction, how uh, loads are transferred, how connections are made, the relationship, perhaps, of surface to structure. Uh, but it's clearly not about orders. It's not about proportion. This is about the pure science and technology and construction of architecture. So a change in the sort of character and tone uh, of some of these the treatises and some of these uh, guidebooks or workbooks or theoretical works, whatever we want to call them at this point. And rather than proportions and ratios, notations here take the form of specs, right? That's how we can compare them to our day. Specifications, notes on uh, forces and connections and different kinds of materials. Uh, we start to see uh, construction details, uh, and sections or x-ray drawings that show elevations with uh, the reinforcing behind it. So we see a change in the composition of drawings and in the scale at which these drawings are presented and the purpose for which they're presented. And the overlay of small-scale details with diagrams on structure and statics and physics. studies of masonry and perhaps the proper way of laying bricks and reinforcing masonry. So again, I want to re-I want to re-emphasize a different set of drawings uh, or drawings done with a very different purpose from what uh, previous treatises and theoretical works have done. So essentially what Rondelet did was to establish a comprehensive theory of materials. Uh, and in 1817, nobody had done this quite the way that he did. He was the first to systematically study the use of iron. And he did this by examining bridges in detail. So, and think about this for a minute. The idea that works of civil engineering can be brought into the realm of architecture was a pretty amazing thing. Uh, 
if you understand architecture as a fine art, uh, then it is perhaps a product of higher learning, it's a product of institutions, uh, it has a sort of metaphysical uh, uh, or history in metaphysics. It would be very difficult to, uh, in that model of thought, relate architecture to uh, these civil structures uh, or these brute works of engineering. So to bring in bridges, works of uh, ingenuity and new materials and in engineering into the realm of architecture uh, was already quite a disruption to the received canon of architecture from the classics. He also developed a new method for calculating building costs. Now you can see this, uh, or in a sense read this, as part of a, uh, an emphasis on function and efficiency. Quite simply, if a building costs too much, it is in excess of its very value in terms of its material and use. And he was one of the first, if not the first, to use the newly introduced metric system, which was approved in 1795 in France. Now think about this for a minute. Now why would we make the point of the metric system? Well, if architecture had roots in the human body, then its entire system of measurement was predicated on that relationship. We use a similar uh, um, measuring system in the United States. You know, we have the foot, for example. So, before the metric system was introduced, the way one would measure things was always in relation to the human body. But to use a metric system is something quite different. Now, buildings and other things are measured not in relation to the human body, but in relation to an abstract Cartesian coordinate system or an abstract uh, field of numbers. So, in many ways, what the introduction of the metric system did is that it gave agency to architects uh, and architectural theorists to continue the work of finding other ways of legitimizing architecture in math, in geometry, but not necessarily in proportion in the mimesis or, or uh, the imitation of nature or the human body. So you get a sort of geometry without proportion. And it was this geometry without proportion that in many ways would impact the career and work of Jean-Nicolas Louis Durand, uh, one of the most important architectural theorists of the 19th century, uh, and certainly one of the most influential architects uh, and theorists for what would become the evolution of modern architecture in its quest for uh, scientific rationality. Now, interestingly, um, Durand was a professor at the École Polytechnique, and many of his students were not architecture students, but were in fact engineering students. Now, of course, the uh, the very fact that he had to teach architecture to engineering students certainly influenced what would eventually become uh, one of the most important set of uh, theories to emerge uh, out of the 19th century. A disciple of Boulay, one of Durand's most important contributions to architectural theory was to transform it into a self-referential instrument for the control of architectural practice. In his Précis de la Con de l'Architecture, written in 1809, Durand defined architecture simply as the art of composing and executing all public and private buildings. So this is a direct contrast to a lot of architectural theory. In contrast to such theory, Durand stressed the irrelevance of any transcendental justification for architecture. In other words, the idea that architecture must be legitimized in something other than itself, the cosmos, the human body, etc., a system of proportions, or what have you. In its place, he theorized an architecture for the first time as something that was autonomous, self-sufficient, and specialized and composed 
exclusively of truths evident to mathematical reason. In contrast to the uh, architectural parlance of Boulet and Ledoux, Durand emphasized not the character of buildings, but rather the arrangement of parts of the plan, what we already know to be the disposition of the plan, or the combinations of different parts along a universal abstract grid. This is essentially an architecture of positivism, an architecture of pure scientific reason and rationality. And in fact, Durand pursues uh, an idea of efficiency that is pretty familiar to those who know basic economic logic, namely that to achieve, that architecture should achieve the maximum result with a minimal amount of effort. You'll notice also that the unidirectional grid has the effect of essentially eliminating any kind of proportional hierarchy or relationship between the architectural elements and essentially anything that is outside of those elements, whether that be nature, whether that be the human body, or anything else. No, the regulating and organizing grid ensures that every architectural element has a clear relationship to other architectural elements. And so what happens is that the architecture now becomes self-referential uh, and becomes autonomous. Again, a product of pure rationality and reason. And one last point about the grid, although we can easily do an entire uh, theory seminar on uh, the role of the grid in architectural and design culture. We can do that very easily. Uh, the grid it has the effect of flattening social and lived space into abstract space. Uh, little reason then that the grid was seen as a tool of progress, as a tool of technology and as a tool of rationalization and would in fact come to define one of the most important and influential organizational systems in the evolution of modern architecture. And so for Durand, architecture became for the first time seen as a sort of formal game, a game of composition in which architectural meaning did not come from anything outside of the architectural system itself. Essentially a game of parts. Now, those parts could be physical, they could be spatial, they could be entire elements, but nonetheless the relationship of the parts are to other parts. Through his study of existing architecture, Durand essentially tried to transform history into a kind of science, and as such uh, would view history as something that is progressive and something that uh, would hold a series of fixed principles, uh, precepts for human conduct or solutions to problems of the architectural discipline. This history as an objective science would be based only on material evidence and again not based on some kind of legitimization of architecture on uh, some kind of transcendental idea or set of ideas. So to sum up Durand and keep in mind these ideas are very important for the evolution of modern architecture, or at least would become very important in the evolution of modern architecture. First, it's worth mentioning again, he was a pupil of Boulet, that revolutionary architect that was interested in character of buildings or the way that buildings speak. But he doesn't share this aesthetic ideal. For Durand, architecture has nothing to do with character. It had to do with the disposition of parts of the plan and composition. Uh, an exercise of pure rationality and reason, scientific, science and math. He considers architecture to be purely the art of composition and economical construction. As such, for Durand, there is no transcendental justification for architecture. That is to say, 
architecture is not a metaphor or a metaphorical image of the cosmos. Architecture relates purely and simply to architecture itself, its own parts. Similarly, nature is not a model for architecture. In other words, for Touron, there can be no relation between the body and the column. Any such relationship is really a myth and not based on science and reason. He finds no beauty in proportion, the argument being that the subjective eye cannot apprehend objective proportions in lived space. Now remember, we mentioned that the grid is the thing that does what? It abstracts lived space. It turns lived space into an abstract field of number and measurement. So, for Durand, anything having to do with proportion, scale, dimension, composition, has to do with these things in abstract space. It is the grid and abstract space through which these things can be comprehended. And, of course, they can be comprehended not subjectively, but through the mind, through the faculty of reason. He finds no meaning in drawings. In other words, drawings are simply the means by which to solve architectural problems. Read working drawings. Now compare this to, for example, Alberti, who argues that architectural drawings, or the diagram, contains this thing called conchinitas, which is the very stuff that nature itself is made of, and therefore architecture resides in the drawing itself. For Turon, no such thing exists. Drawings are simply instruments. They are the things that architects use to solve the problem of architecture, really, which is the problem of composition, and the means by which architecture is understood and constructed. But there's no inherent meaning in the drawings themselves outside of their function and outside of their use. Architecture is purely the product of mathematical reasoning toward pure efficiency. In other words, this is the economic logic that he uses. Architecture should attain maximum result by combining minimum effort and maximum economy. And ultimately, architecture is the combination of parts and the disposition of the plan.